Okay, we're going to talk about ocean energy today, and in honor of ocean energy, I have my jellyfish shirt on. I've got jellyfish earrings on. We've got to dive into the ocean and talk about the ocean. Um, this is a recent photo, actually, I took. So I heard about this awesome super bloom that's going on, you know, because of all the rain we've had. And so my kids and I went to Mori Point, which is in Pacifica, um, and it was beautiful. And we weren't the only people that had that idea. Um, there were a lot of people enjoying the flowers and the ocean. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about ocean energy today, uh, the potential and, and what's going on, uh, and the different ways we can harness ocean energy, because there's lots of different ways, and they have advantages and disadvantages. Um, some of the big things to take away from today's talk, we often refer to ocean as one of our Ps. If you think about our different energy resources of fruit, you know, wind and solar are kind of watermelons and renewable. Ocean is really a P and maybe even smaller, might be more of like a sesame seed. It's not commercial um, in any sort of scale yet. It's very much in demonstration and there's been demonstration for a long time. It's been research scale for a long time. Um, the ocean, as you kind of, kind of imagine, it's a very harsh environment. It's salt water, it's stormy, there's waves, there's winds, there's all this stuff. And when you have mechanical parts that you're putting in the ocean, it's hard to have things that last. And so it is a major challenge technologically and financially. But we'll, we'll talk all about all those details today. Uh, posing some big questions. Um, for ocean energy, it's really just thinking about how does this compare? Because how we're investing our, our limited resources in the green energy of the future, where does ocean energy fit in that? So something to think about as, as we go through the lecture today. So our timeline for today, we're gonna to start in just like big picture potential, a little bit about um, the environment, and then we're gonna dive into the different ways we can use our energy resource of the ocean. Um, and so I've kind of categorized them in terms of the type of energy. So we're gonna talk about kinetic forms of ocean energy that we can use. Then we're gonna talk about thermal, um, and then super briefly, um, chemical differences because there's really not a lot going on in that area. But just so you're aware that that is an area that could be used for ocean energy. You've seen this chart before, uh, just to remind you that ocean falls in this renewable category. Um, we're not using up our ocean resource. Um, just like we talked about with wind, a lot of our ocean resource is driven by the sun, which is constantly giving us new energy. So using it doesn't use it up. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have local impacts on flows, on sediments, on, on things like that. So there's definitely local changes when you start using your ocean resource. So thinking about some drivers and barriers, which are just kind of big picture for ocean energy. Renewable resource, no, no air pollution or greenhouse gas emissions. Significant potential when you look at you know, the globe. We have obviously a lot of our globe covered by the ocean. But whether that potential can actually be realized is, is challenging, and we'll talk about the, the challenges of that. Water is very dense, so when we're talking about things like comparing flows in terms of currents, you can use a much smaller turbine, for example, if you have a very dense fluid like water, than like the air for our wind turbines, and get the same amount of, of energy out of that flow. Um, and so that's one of the advantages of our kinetic ocean energy. It's very predictable if you're talking about tides. We know when we're gonna have them, we know how big they're gonna be, we know when it changes. Um, so unlike some of our other energy resources, it's very predictable, we know exactly when that's gonna happen. High demand centers are often coastal, and so this can be an advantage uh, that we see. You know, We're seeing that for offshore wind, perhaps, but also for ocean energy. It also can be a resource for islands, which often don't have a lot of options. Um, they're land, land limited, there's, there's other limitations, and so ocean energy can be an option for them. Potential to produce fresh water, which we'll talk about, and so uh, again on islands especially where fresh water might be a limitation, you can produce energy and fresh water at the same time. But there's also a lot of barriers. So NIMBY is a problem, sometimes less so than offshore wind because some of the ocean uh, energy options are underwater, so you don't actually see them. Um, but some of them don't have that advantage. Very site specific, it's, you have to be where the ocean energy is. Really a big, big barrier is the harsh environment. Um, it's making these things last in that salty water through storms um, and biofouling and everything else that's happening in the, in the ocean. 
It can depend on weather, weather patterns, especially for waves. So that one's not, as, not predictable. Technology is still very much research phase. So following on that, it's very much not cost competitive with our other renewable energy options. Uh, there's definitely inconsistent policy support. That's not just true here in the US. Uh, we've seen that other places, um, Europe, China, but there is some and there's some growing interest in some places. And then, of course, you have environmental concerns like marine life. Um, and that includes not just like the fish and corals or other ecosystems, but also the marine mammals that might go through some of these, these places. Competing uses for humans, recreation, fishing, and marine navigation, um, and, and relatively low investment, which we'll talk about. OK, so again, an interesting P. There's some interesting things going on. It might be really important in certain sites where there aren't a lot of options, but it's not contributing significantly to our global uh, energy uh, system at this point. All right, so just give you a kind of a one page overview of our ocean energy options and where we're at today. So the different colors are the three different energy forms. So green is kinetic, the, the kind of pink is temperature, and the yellow is chemical. To give you a sense of the global potential, just on one page, it's big. It's big in all these areas, and we'll, we'll go into that as we get into each one. And so there's huge potential, but very little installed happening. And can't even say that that stalled is necessarily growing. A lot of the installed, even when it gets grid connected, sometimes it's a two year, a five year, they take it back out. It might be a demonstration project, a research project, something that is very early stage. Um, and so we see a lot of changeover in terms of ocean energy installations because it is very, um, very early stage. And I just wanted to give you a sense of where a lot of the interest is happening right now um, and what countries, I would say Scotland's kind of got the most exciting stuff going on in, in tidal, um, especially tidal current um, uh, research and development. And China's doing a lot looking at WAVE right now, um, investing a lot there. There are other countries involved, and we'll talk about some of those projects, but it's really, just keep in mind, it's really pretty small scale. So this is where it looks like when we're comparing it to our other energy, our renewable energy resources in terms of the, the production of global electricity or the installed capacity in this, in this case. You can see ocean installed capacity, it's like half a gigawatt compared to some of our other uh, renewable energy resources, very, very small. In 2021, it did grow. Um, but not by much. And like I said, it doesn't grow every year. It kind of depends on whether things are being added or taken out um, to see how they're, they're actually adapting to that ocean environment, how they're surviving. Um, so there's, a, there's some interest. The EU recently set a target for having some ocean power uh, capacity by 2050, but really it's, it's early stages. So this is kind of what's happening now. The environmental impacts are probably pretty obvious to you on a lot of these. Um, when we're thinking about how is it impacting and how do we mitigate those environmental impacts um, when we're gonna be using ocean energy. So wildlife, you have to think about migration patterns, habitats, uh, protection from impact. Uh, if you watch the video, noise is, is also a challenge, but also can keep them away from having impact. So there's kind of uh, benefits also to the noise. The, the wildlife will, avoid a lot of the, the ocean energy um, technology that's in the water. You have local effects that are gonna change temperature, it could change salinity, it could change the, the flat patterns of current and the way that um, you know, nutrients or other things flow. And so there's a lot of complex uh, impacts you can have when you start changing current flow, you start changing um, tidal flows, things like that. So shorelines, you're really going to see that impact when you start using wave energy in terms of how is that impacting the sand sedimentation uh, along the, the shores. Temperature, when we talk about our, our temperature technologies, you're changing the temperature of surface water. And then, of course, the human, the NIMBY, and the longevity. So all of these challenges, pretty obvious, but things that we really haven't quite figured out yet, um, really early stages on ocean energy. So let's talk about what it is and the different ways that we can make use of our ocean energy. So here we're gonna start in kinetic. 
Um, so that's flowing or oscillating. And so let's, let's first talk about flowing, which is tidal energy or currents. And so you saw in your video, and you probably, guys probably already knew how tides work. Um, tides are caused by the bulging of the ocean because of the gravitational pull of the moon. And sometimes when it aligns with the sun, you can even get bigger bulges in our, our ocean um, that, that causes higher or lower tides. Very, very predictable, not dispatchable. We can't choose when we have our tidal energy available, but certainly we know when it's gonna happen. So that, that's its advantage. There's two different ways that we take advantage of our tides. One is a tidal barrage system. That one just think hydroelectric dam. It's like, it's like a hydroelectric dam, but we're using tides instead of the hydrologic cycle to fill up our dam. The other one is tidal current. So think like a wind farm. We're just taking advantage of the tides flowing through an area to extract energy for electricity production. Where are the locations? So this is a map kind of showing you some of the, where some of the big tides occur. Um, if you wanna see some uh, interesting big tides, and we'll talk about it in a minute, um, some of the biggest tides occur right up there in the northeastern part of the US, right next to Canada, an area called Bay of Fundy. Um, but you can see that there are lots of areas along our coast that have pretty significant tides. We talk about tides, we're talking about it in two different ways. The range, which is kind of like the head when we're thinking about our hydro dam. That's how high the tide goes. And you want volume. So volume also matters, is how much water is, is, uh, are you able to get in that area. And so a lot of times it has to do, with the tides have to do with the shape of the shoreline. Um, that really impacts your tidal resource. So here's a picture of Bay of Fundy, which has the biggest tides in the world. Um, where literally it's a wave of water. It's like a wall of water that comes in every day. Um, this has to do with the, just the shape of the bay and the tides because you get a resonant frequency. And so it's almost like a slosh as the tides come in and the slosh as the tides go out. And so you get these, these huge um, waves that come in. Um, I actually got to visit the Bay of Fundy um, and they do this thing they call tidal bore rafting where you go out in a little boat and you like ride the wave in. Uh, you get all muddy and everything, it's very muddy water. Um, but it's, it's huge. So this is, again, it's like we could take advantage of this for energy, and there are parts of the Bay of Fundy that they do this. They have a small tidal barrage system there. But there's also recreation and other things that are going on. So there's, again, this competing uses for a lot of our ocean energy resources. They did put in this little tidal energy platform um, to, and connected it to the grid this year. I haven't seen the latest on it and whether it's still operating. Um, ocean energy, it's often like you kind of have to keep checking because things will happen and things will get will change a lot. But this is something that would be less intrusive than a tidal barrage, right? So you're taking, you're doing tidal current rather than blocking it off, like damming it off. Looking at the potential in the US for tidal, um, it's about 3% of our electricity use, so that's the total potential of the tidal energy we have here in the US, so it's not a lot. Much of it is up in Alaska, and you're gonna see that in a lot of these resources. A lot of these resources, you have most of the potential up in Alaska, um, which isn't where we have high population centers, but it is where we have rural communities that have very expensive energy, and so this is where some sites it might make sense to have some of these um, ocean energy options to really provide um, rural communities with, with more options, and more diversity of resources. Okay, so in the video kind of talked about this, but how does a tidal barrage work? It's like a hydro dam, except that you're letting the water flow in through the turbines going one way and then out through the turbines going back. And so um, it's kind of like filling up your basin with high tide and then you let it flow back out at low tide. Again, predictable, but not dispatchable. We can't pick. What's, what do you think one of the, what do you think the biggest environmental concern is with tidal barrage systems? Yeah, absolutely. You are blocking off a bay, a harbor, an inlet, something where you know, wildlife had gone in and out and you're damming it, right? So you're having that, that impact, you know, and just like we saw with, with hydro dams, you know, fish going through there, um, you know, they have, um, you know, there's mortality and stuff for the, for the fish going through there, depending on the, the system. And so it is blocking off an inlet and definitely changing 
the habitat and ecosystem and the connection to the ocean. And so you do have to worry about that. They talk about these in your videos, but there's two really big tidal barrage systems. One that's been operating since the late 60s uh, in France, um, and you can see it across there. And so that's, that's a dam. That's a bridge, but it's also a dam. And it's, so it's, again, it's disconnecting that bay from the ocean. And then there is this, this one in South Korea that was built in 2011. Uh, the joke was that they built it slightly bigger just so they could have the biggest um, tidal barrage system in the world. That's, th that's it. Those are the two big ones. That is most of our ocean energy today are those two locations. Everything else is very small scale. Um, I said that there was, there was one um, at, up in the Bay of Fundy, and so this is a former TA. She, she went to the little visitor center. Um, it's at a little piece, a part, portion of the bay um, that has a very small 20 megawatt system. Um, so again, small scale. The second way we can make use of tidal is just as a current, as it's flowing. Um, and there's some places where this is, this is a good resource, especially in places where it gets squeezed. So like we talked about with Bernoulli's pr principle, you have a flow of water and you squeeze it through like two land, land masses, you're gonna speed up that flow. And so then that's a great place to take advantage of tidal current. So tidal current, there's a lots of different ideas on how we could take advantage of tidal current. I would say most of the technologies that are going in today have really centered around making them look like underwater wind turbines. Uh, they're now three bladed, kind of like our, our wind turbines. They're just like little um, wind turbines that we're putting in the, in the water. Um, and Scotland is where a lot of that uh, is happening. And so this is what it looks like in some of the installations going on in Scotland. They have these, these little tidal wind turbines that they're putting in and they can take them out for maintenance um, with a crane on a, on a boat. So again, this is a space where they have an island and the, the landform and it's squeezing the tides to make a pretty good tidal energy resource. We've tried tidal energy here in the US as well. Um, back in 2012, we installed a horizontal axis, kind of looks like a horizontal axis wind turbine if anybody's ever seen those, but on, laid on its side. So again, you know, very similar to the wind technology industry. Um, it produced some electricity for a while um, and then they took it out and that's, there's still ongoing conversation about whether um, and when these kind of things we put back in. I did want to say, even though we're talking about the ocean today, that you could do this in rivers too. Um, so we don't have to dam our rivers. We talked about having run of river systems. You could also have this type of run of river system. Um, and so there are there is some research going on in that and looking at run of river systems that would be more like a tidal current, you know, more like wind turbines underwater, or horizontal axis wind turbines in this case, underwater. So different ways to take advantage of that flowing energy. The other kinetic way, the other currents are ocean currents. So these are, these are not run by tides, right? Our ocean currents are the big currents, like the Gulf Stream is the one that's often talked about. The, the Gulf Stream is the one that's coming from the Gulf of Mexico and going up to Europe. It's the stream that really keeps Europe's uh, at weather much warmer than, say, Canada, right? They're at the same latitude, but because of the Gulf Stream bringing that warm water up to Europe, it has much milder um, weather patterns than, than Canada. You can use currents like that to also as a uh, ocean energy research, I mean ocean energy resource. Um, nothing is really happening in this. There's a little bit of research or somehow down in Florida. It's a pretty low energy dense resource. Even though these are giant currents, they're not, there's not a lot of energy to extract. It's not it's the fast moving water that we see with tidal energy. Um, and so because the resource is pretty limited and because these, these currents are pretty important for weather patterns, there's already concerns about the Gulf Stream and how the melting ice in Greenland is gonna impact it, how that could impact Europe. Um, this isn't an area that we're really looking at as a ocean energy research uh, or ocean energy resource today. The other way we do kinetic, and I would say the one that often comes to mind is a wave energy. Um, and there's lots of different technologies and ideas and people continue to try to make use of our waves as an energy resource in the ocean. 
I like this cover, this magazine cover from the 1930s uh, because it shows this, this idea for having a wave motion, um, you know, uh, device that's, that's, connect, that's collecting that, that um, ocean energy. And the ideas that we have today aren't that much different than what they were thinking about before. Um, if, as you saw in the video, the challenge with, with wave energy is that unlike tidal, it's not a flow. You're, the water isn't flowing, the wave is moving through the water. And so you have to have something that, that translates that up and down motion or sometimes a side to side motion into something that's a mechanical energy that you can then rotate and create electricity. So it's a different way of collecting that, that it's a different resource that you have to collect in order to turn it into uh, electricity generation. So it's a, a little bit more complicated. The way we talk about wave power, it's rated in kilowatts per length of wave, or often thought about as meter of shoreline. And so that's, that's what this chart is showing you. These are numbers are the power per length of wave. Um, and you saw some of this in the, in the video. Some of the places you can see here on the western part of Australia, some out here uh, in Europe, and of course, Alaska has some really good um, wave uh, resources. Here, just zooming in on the US, where you can see more about, again, the, a lot of our wave energy resource is, is in Alaska. As you might imagine, with our waves, where the best waves are, there's also a lot of NIMBY. There, that's the best surfing spots. And there's also where you have the harshest environment for these, these devices to survive. And so it is, it's a very challenging environment. There's three different ways that we can harness wave energy. The one that is used most is this third one, the, the floating or pitching devices in the red. That's the stuff where it's like moving. You have them moving up and down or back and forth or something and you're trying to translate that into rotational energy to produce electricity. Oscillating water column, and then we actually have some uh, places where this is done. What you're doing with an oscillating water column is as the wave comes in, it's pushing air through a turbine. So again, you're translating that that wave that's moving through the water into a flow of air that goes through a turbine. And it's a special kind of turbine that turns the same direction no matter which way the, the flow is going past it. And so it'll push the air past it one way and have it turn, and then it'll suck the air back down as the wave goes out, and the, the air will flow back through it until you get a constantly turning um, turbine on oscillating water column. And then the wave surge or focusing, which there isn't a lot going on with right now, the idea there is that you're capturing the wave as it comes into something and then you're having it flow back out through a turbine. Again, you're translating a wave into a flow in order to capture that, that energy. You can do that in a floating device, which is kind of shown up there in the blue box where it's just something that's floating and you have the wave crash over it and then have the water run back out through the turbines or you can do it on shore. And so some of the places you actually build a basin and you have the waves crash over that basin and then flow back out as the wave comes, comes down. Okay, so let's look at some fun options for wave energy. Um, and I, I would say there's new things coming up all the time, but they have this basic, some of the, a lot of the basic same principles. This one I thought was interesting. This is something you can just install on piers. So it's something where we already have infrastructure and these bob up and down with the, the waves that are along the pier. Um, and then be, since this is so close to shore and it's already on an infrastructure, you can have that translate into electricity production and, and power on, on land. Um, so they have a pretty, some pretty cool videos on how they're doing that. The oscillating water column uh, demonstration, this was a floating one called the Mighty Whale. The idea was that you would have the floating thing and it would capture that water and you can see why it was called the mighty whale. They made it look like a whale. Um, this is an older technology, is no longer operating, but was one of the early ideas. Another early idea for the prototype pitching or floating types um, was, was this big um, snake type thing that would go back and forth with the waves. Um, that, there was a lot of excitement about that, so I still include it. But um, that, that startup did not, did not last, and I think it, it's filed for bankruptcy, and I don't think there's a lot going on with that now. And then more of the more recent technologies are more about up and down motion. And so whether they're floating like this one, 
or they're underwater like this installation in Australia. There are devices that are going up and down and making a pumping motion that, that can, then can be formed into a flow to turn our turbines and um, make electricity. So lots of different ideas, a lot of excitement. This is another one where it's just offshore, kind of like the ones along the pier, but you have these big things going up and down. But again, um, very much research and development stage and not a ton of investment going into this area. So kind of just include these so you can go check out some of the videos if you want to see them. With ocean energy, especially given the stage it is in, it really needs a lot of government support in order to be successful. And so here I'm just showing you um, one of the efforts that the, the DOE is supporting called PacWave. Um, a lot of research going on at Oregon State University. Some of what the, the DOE and the US government is trying to do is fund the research for the technology, but also look at permitting and go ahead and set aside places to, to test and try out the different ocean energy resources. So if you can smooth, you know, streamline some of that process, you can get these devices in and try them out in a, in a faster manner. And so both of those efforts are kind of aligned um, with, with PacWave. And you can see all the different things that they're trying out. So you saw some of that in the video. All right, let's talk about thermal. Um, so ocean thermal, and you guys also had a video about this. Now we are doing our traditional, just like kind of like a steam cycle power plant. We are turning a turbine that turns a generator. We have to have a hot source and a cold sink. It is a heat engine. We're using thermal. The difference with ocean thermal versus what we were doing in our steam cycle power plants is what, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that the surface of the ocean is hotter than the deep ocean. So the sun is warming up the surface. It's warming that up and it's way colder down deep. And so because we have that thermal gradient, we can run basically a, a heat engine. We can't use steam, right? We can't heat up water. The, the surface of the ocean isn't that hot. So we have to get a little bit more creative with it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Where is it hottest? Near the equator. And so our ocean thermal uh, resource is really concentrated around the equator where our oceans are hottest and we have deep enough oceans where it's cold down below. California coast, for example, is, would be a very poor resource because we have a lot of upwelling. That's what causes our fog. We have a very cold ocean surface. Um, we have deep ocean water that comes up, very nutrient rich, which is great for our wildlife, but makes it so it's, it's not a candidate for, for ocean thermal energy conversion. And so I just want to remind you of Carnot, who, run, who kind of rules uh, the efficiency of our, our heat engines. We can only get so efficient with ocean thermal because there's only, there is a temperature difference, but it's not huge. It's not like our steam cycle power plant. Okay, so what does that look like? There's two different types of ocean thermal energy conversion systems, closed loop and open loop. So closed loop or closed cycle, um, what you're doing here is instead of evaporating water, which we can't, we can't make steam, it's not hot enough, we're evaporating something that evaporates at a, at a colder temperature. So a lot of times that's something like ammonia or propane, something that's gonna evaporate at a lower temperature. We're using the warm seawater from the surface to evaporate it. That's your working fluid. That's what's gonna turn your turbine, turn your generator, just like our steam cycle. And then you're using the cold seawater as your heat sink. And so, you're just running this uh, cycle using a different, a different fluid. Um, you will see this come up again when we start talking about geothermal, because we also use, we call them binary cycles in geothermal. Same idea, you're heating up something that evaporates at a, at a lower temperature than water. So this is just running your thermal system. Um, we do have a demonstration plant doing this. It's been doing this actually, I think, for, uh, since 2015, so quite a while. Small, 105 kilowatt system. Again, you know, these systems aren't gonna be huge. You only have so much temperature difference. Um, but it, it has been operating for a long time. They have talked about plans to do more of this um, type of system in Hawaii. Again, in a place where you have warm water, you have cold water below, and you're an island which has limited other options. 
Um, so you can learn more about their uh, operating OTEC plant there. What you're often doing is taking the surface water close to shore where it's hot and you're re rejecting it back out far from shore because you don't want to take that cold water that you're taking up and mess up the warm water that you're pulling off. And so you have to pull in the water one place and reject it somewhere else um, where they're not mixing. Okay, open cycle um, systems have an advantage that they make fresh water when you're doing it. They have a disadvantage that they are less efficient than our closed cycle. So it kind of depends on if you need that fresh water, if you want that um, extra system to, to do that. In this case, instead of using a working fluid to run our, our heat engine, we are using the water itself, but at a much lower pressure, so that at that temperature, it is evaporating. And so you're literally using the warm seawater as your working fluid, go, running it through an evaporator and, and under a very low pressure or even a vacuum. You have that water vapor going through your turbine, just like we see in our, our steam cycle power plant. And when you cool it off, it's now fresh water. Because when you evaporate it, you're just evaporating the water. The salt water all comes out the bottom of the evaporator. So what you end up is fresh water coming through your cycle, but you also end up with super, super salty water coming out of your evaporator. So you do have to discharge that super salty water somewhere where hopefully it's not impacting the habitat or the environment. But it does produce uh, fresh water. And so this, this is an advantage of this, this kind of system. Okay. Any questions about ocean thermal? Is there any use of geothermal vents in the ocean? That is a great question. No, none that I know of. Um, but all of geothermal that I know of is all on land. But that's, that's a great question. Yeah. Have they ever thought about co-locating one of these plants with a thermal generation plant where they can use a once-through cooling tube as an intake? Not, none that I know of. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, in California, we're, we're kind of getting rid of all those ish power plants um so i don't know of any that they're they're making use of that that water that way it's a good question any other questions on that how does the cost of these ocean thermal systems compare to other renewable energy systems they're really expensive in comparison um, i think both because um, salt water is just kind of a hard fluid to work with. I mean, we can, but it's, there's a lot of biofouling. There's a lot of stuff you have to deal with. With salt water, it rusts everything. Um, and, and also, it's just, it's, they're so early stage. You don't have any economies of scale. Um, and so we saw that with wind and solar when they were in their infancy as well. They're, they're just expensive. And so I have some cost estimates at the end, but they're all estimates. They're not real. Yeah, great question. Okay, let's talk about chemical, um, so salinity gradient. What we're doing here is um, we can make use of the fact that freshwater and saltwater have uh, different osmotic pressures because they have different salinity. And so where you're seeing this is where those two things come together. So where you have a river, for example, flowing into the ocean, you will have a salinity gradient. You'll have the freshwater from the river and the saltwater from the ocean, and you can take advantage of that. This is just a small, I guess, sort of a river um, in Pacifica to just give you the idea. But it's just think about where it's where that fresh water and salt water are coming together in the ocean. So you have this slight difference in osmotic pressure when you have pure water and salt water, and you can take advantage of this. There's a lot of potential. You know, um, you have the Amazon, and you also have the Nile River in um, Africa going into the ocean. There are different places where you have massive salt water and fresh water mixing, but that pressure difference isn't huge. And so even though you have a lot of potential because it's happening a lot, it's at that interface, it's, it's not a lot of power. And so there's been some research on this, uh, but there isn't a lot going on, I would say, in, in salinity, salinity gradient energy. So this is more just to make you aware that that's an option, but it's not one that we're really exploring actively right now. Let's talk about the future of ocean, ocean energy. Um, and this really has a lot to do with investment and just, just estimates of where we're going. So looking at investment, um, ocean energy investment is really, really small. And so that's one of its challenges, right? There's not a lot of investment going on in it. Um, so this is, this is a chart from REN21, their global status report. And you can see wind and solar are way higher than anybody else. Um, and then our other renewable energy resources here and ocean power is almost undetectable in some of its categories. 
right? So it's a very, very small investment on the ocean energy side. There have been estimates looking at, to your point, LCOE of these different ocean energy resources, wave, tidal, and ocean thermal, um, but there isn't a lot of data for those estimates uh, because it's very just much just like guessing on how it would be if they were at scale and if they were being installed commercially, et cetera. It's not a commercial technology yet. Even with those estimates, they're way higher than our other renewable energy resources. Um, and so the cost competitiveness, even looking to the future, uh, doesn't look great for ocean energy. I mentioned that there's um, some efforts at the federal level to, to try to encourage some ocean energy re uh, research and development. There's some permitting going on. Um, even these projects that get approved, so you can see 2021, there was 21 megawatts approved. Not all of them get installed. And so it's really hard to get a sense of how much activity really is happening in the ocean energy space, even here in the US. So what is our future outlook? Like I said, huge local potential resource, um, pretty selective, speculative, we're not getting there, regulatory hurdles. Um, we, we just, it's just early stages. Um, and so it's really hard to say where ocean energy is, is going to happen um, and when. So I would expect it to be important locally in some places. Um, but not be a significant contributor to the global energy system, but we'll have to see. All right, and that's all I had for, for ocean energy.